Hey guys, it's Julesy and I'm gonna try something supremely ridiculous because I have a friend and I have to go pick up from the airport in like 20 minutes. But let's see if we can do some sort of review while we're here. Why not? And she's gotta have it season two. I took some notes. Ooh, is this not the notebook I used to take the notes? Okay, here we go, we have them. Didn't really take that many notes, I guess. I watched all the episodes and I'm gonna tell you, I am not a person, I'm not a big TV watcher in this current era of my life. Um, and I prefer to multitask because I just have so many things going on and it's like, please let me get these things done. But I did for the sake of you guys, watch the second season of She's Gotta Have It. And I must say that I was thoroughly non plus. I didn't really care for this season. And overall, if I was to give like an upfront review of the entire season. I don't know, is it fair to say that season one was better? I feel like I gave season one more forgiveness because it was the first season. And you know, the first season you're still working out some of your kinks and it was just easier to kind of digest and like not be as critical as I am of this second season. But I feel like there were very valid criticisms of the first season and none of them were really addressed in the second season. If anything, it felt even more regressive than the first season did. As I did with the first season, I thoroughly enjoyed the music. I don't really mind the all the nose features of like what songs are playing. I, I actually appreciate that everyone doesn't have the same access points to knowledge and information as everyone else does. And that we all have to learn at some point. So even the all the nose quotes of like this, that was a Zora Neale Hurston quote. I get it, I appreciate it. Now for me, as someone who lived in Brooklyn for eight plus years, who is very invested in the arts, involved in the arts, was involved in the arts when I lived in New York, a lot of this stuff was very, um, a lot of the nods and notes and whatever was stuff I already know about, stuff I've seen. Um, and overall, I understand Spike Lee's style of filmography and I understand his style of like almost character-like characters. But I think there's quite a few films where that's, the Spike Lee style has worked very well and been very enjoyable and is still enjoyable in 2019. Feel, I feel like that do, it doesn't connect in season two because everything is so disjointed. And I don't mind a series where each episode is, is its own story, its own vignette. But if we're gonna have the same characters in the same roles, there does need to be some sort of con congruency, some sort of, character arc, some sort of narrative that evolves and really sticks with the character. And I don't feel, it was just spastic and all over the place. And it just felt like a lot of the things that were put, inserted in, these, in this season were inserted for the sake of being inserted. Like, oh, we need to talk about gentrification. Boom, gentrifier. Oh, we need to talk about wealthy white liberals in the black art space. Boom. Like, and then it doesn't really make sense considering even within that 30 minute episode, it doesn't make a lot of sense considering what the actual storyline was. Okay, so what do I do like? I like the filmography. I like the, the director photography. I like how the, the series looks, the aesthetic. Like you could put this on mute and just play it in the background and it is beautiful black people in Brooklyn all day long. I don't like Nola Darling the person and I actually like that I don't like Nola Darling the person because I do like seeing black women that are not likable. I think that is a character arc that we are allowed to explore and I guess that's what we did. But her hair looked great, her outfits looked great. She looked really good this season. A lot of the music does go really well. You get a lot of beautiful, just like you could make stills of this entire series and it would come out gorgeous. I love, you know, when you open up a shot of Brooklyn with the Roy Ayers. You know, I, rem I have a very keen memory of being, what's the park in, in Bed-Stuy? What was in Bed-Stuy? I feel like I've seen Roy Ayers during two summer stages. One, there's a park in Bed-Stuy off of like Throop, or yeah, it's Throop, back past gates, like in the hood of Bed-Stuy, that little park. It's like Van Throop or something park. And then I think I remember seeing him in a park over by the hospital in Flatbush. Yeah, and so like, everybody loves the sunshine. That like is really, every time I hear that song, I think of Brooklyn. And so it makes so much sense to like, it just, that was nostalgic for me. They opened with a Zora Neale Hurston quote from their eyes were watching God. Yes, you know, I'm, I'm a Zora stan, so I ain't really made 80. It's like, 
okay, we get it. But you know, I hope I hope it inspired a bevy of young, not just black women, but not even just young people, but people in general to pick up a Zora Neale Hurston book. I really do hope so. The sex scene that we get into with Nola Darling and Opal. Um, long hair gets in the way of sex. I wouldn't even wear this. Like I, would I wear, have I worn this? Girl, put in a ponytail though, if I have. I feel like, wait, I, I'm gonna tell on myself, I have. And I put it in a ponytail because long hair just gets, like how, how I don't know, some of us have hot spots, the, the hair blocks, and so maybe it's different for them. I mean, I, I felt like maybe certain decisions were made in this series to ensure that the still, the photo of it would be beautiful. Because uh, sure, it's a, it's a cute shot with Nola holding her hair out like this, but we be sweaty, we be nasty. I don't know, man, is that, I, I don't know. I wasn't necessarily buying it, but you know, maybe it did something for someone else and I'm not mad at it. I almost wanna get into like the various parts of, that we don't do touch in the series, whether it's Opal and Nola's relationship, Nola's relationship with Opal's daughter, but like, everything is kind of like, it's just like the foam on the top and then once the phone passed, there's really nothing beneath the phone. You know, that whole like Nola being Nola and being very presumptuous and very selfish and self-centered and not listening to the mother. Like Opal is your partner who you're claiming you're in love with and that is her child. And you have to respect her boundaries. You know, I just don't, I don't know man. It happens, it's noted and then we move on, right? And it doesn't really, come back up. I don't know. I just, I don't, mm. I don't know that we needed to keep on the story with the same four men from the film and the first season because Jamie Overstreet to me doesn't make any sense. I liked Mars in the first season and I don't even mind Mars in this season because I do think his actual character arc and it's, and I guess because Mars is essentially Spike Lee and I can forgive all the please baby please because you know I bought both your books please baby please and please dog please please puppy please that book that Spike Lee wrote with his wife Sonia or whatever her name Tanya bruh I'm giving people random names the book Spike Lee wrote with his wife um I've bought both of them numerous times for friends and baby shower gifts but you know the please baby please 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 baby please line that I squeeze in for everything I actually like that quote of like Afro Latina the sister who is in the Santeria I I like the ability to dig into that and provide that imagery but I still don't think they like I think they could have just did you know what I mean like move the needle a little bit in deeper you know like even when we go to Puerto Rico with Nola and Mars I think we get a very kind of whitewashed surface understanding of, of Santeria everything relies on Oshun Oshun is everyone's god at this point and I'm like there is so much more to Santeria there are so many different ways to approach it and to you know and I get these are short vignettes these are short episodes but I, I'm not asking for like massive production but I just think things come move beyond the cliche they could move beyond the the stereotypical and the things that we kind of already discussed um you know like we have seen Oshun come out of the water in yellow whether it's Beyonce and now the random black woman walking down the street in Puerto Rico like it's like okay cool I would just like you know I don't know because Nola is so vapid that if we're gonna if we're gonna have her have this moment of awakening through a religion that really does embrace you know, the spirits of African goddesses, that maybe there was just more. I don't know, Mami Wata maybe even. I don't know, bruh. I just feel like it was just something else that could have been done and I, it wasn't hitting for me. Uh, can we discuss Fat Joe's accent? Because Fat Joe actually already has a New York accent in real life. So, the, come on, baby. I don't know what the come on, baby shit he was doing in the, in the film was. I, I can't hit it. The affect. What what we what are we getting here? There wasn't any lead up. So Mecca's story with the whole butt and the injections and her supposedly going through with it or something about seemingly about to go through with it and then actually turning in and helping do a cop bust of the woman who was doing these backroom butt shots. And again, there, there's no build up. There's no discussion. There's not really a storyline to it. It happens and then that's it. And it's kind of like, okay, we need to make a statement about butts and how butt shots are killing black women and how evil this is. Boom, evil black woman, butt shots, backroom, cops. Boom, boom, handled it. And I just was like, 
we're not gonna discuss it again. Like, how did Mecca go from being so invested and seemingly so unsecure about her body to suddenly having the confidence to uh, participate in a police thing. A lot of the artwork that we see of Nola's is painted by T. Lynn Faze. That's her app on Instagram. Her name, I believe her name was Tatiana. Can't pronounce the last name. I'll put it on the screen here. I actually am a big fan of her artwork. I follow it. I love it. I don't know what happened between the point of Tati being picked up, Tatiana being picked up. Sorry, we call my sister's name is Tatiana. We call her Tati. But Tatiana being picked up and selected as the artist to create the artwork for this, for She's Gotta Have It. I don't know what kind of direction they gave her. I don't know what they asked of her for. Um, but this is what I'm about to say is no indictment of her. I don't think No Dog is a good artist. And it's not because the work, like structurally the art isn't good. Like she can draw, it's just not captivating. It doesn't tell a story. There is nothing dynamic about it and it really falls flat on the face and it seems like Nola Dar Darling lack. well she does, she lacks introspection and the vulnerability to really sincerely be a good artist and I feel like, I don't know, I it just in in the in the series i'm like looking at the shit like it's not it's not good now that whole art scene when she goes to what oak bluff we literally get the history of oak bluff told to us in the series and then the character of the art guy with the blazer with the short sleeves and the oh man oh man everything was just and dean hagen it was like what the fuck bruh it, it was so cringy and so unfortunate though because so many great artists are actually featured throughout that scene and set up oh i don't know i'm gonna run blank because i didn't write the names down on everyone featured love seeing amy shepherd who did uh michelle obama's portrait for the national mall there was so many great black artists who are featured who are part of the canyon of black art and have been doing some really great work and you know they lend their voices Carrie Mae Weems and then you have these characters and you just have this really weak storyline and I thought like there was so many things that could have been done with that and acknowledged and then to take that art scene and the one takeaway we take a, is from it besides a Dean Hagen setup and then him whatever that was meant to be was her meeting this Nigerian artist who likes to wear kente cloth which is Ghanaian okay bruh then he proceeds to allow Nola Darling to mispronounce the names of prominent Nigerians and I don't know I wrote a note down that oh and he's Fulani did he say in this in the episode that he's Fulani there was a lot of um criticism and discussion around that scene where it was John Boyega and I might be mispronouncing people's name let me you excuse my colonizer tongue but Noah's character mispronounces two prominent modern current um Nigerian African actors names and then makes a statement about in line with what Samuel L. Jackson said maybe three, four years ago about Nigerian actors or African actors coming and taking our roles. And again, like we are, like first of all, you know I don't do xenophobia or bigotry. I will never support that. I will never endorse that. I don't have enough time to get into this right now. Um, Maybe, I don't know that I would want to do a video on this because the comments would just be the shit. But if you want to discuss this idea of what does it mean for non-Black American, non-descendants of American slavery to be playing prominent Black historical characters, I think we would also have to discuss what does it mean for Black American actors to be playing prominent African characters, as in like Idi Amin and then whatever Don Cheadle did or whatever Will Smith did. That it has been a two-way street and I don't even think what's happening is that African actors are coming to America and taking our roles. First of all, what we need to be fighting is white supremacy. What we need to be fighting is the fact that black roles are so few and far between. The, 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 there should be a much bigger table for us to sit at across, not just from the actors, but from the casting directors, from the showrunners, from the directors of photography, the director of lighting, the musical directors, all these roles entire. We need more black faces and accessibility for the black community in the overall hall of the media world. And also that all these actors you're talking about are coming through London. You know, it is the privilege of, of, I don't even want to say that this is necessarily the privilege of immigration, but there is sort of this black exceptionalism that exists in the sphere of the African diaspora. And it is that who is allowed to access this privileged sphere overall 
I mean, it's it's sort of why you see the same black American actors continually getting cast in all the black roles. You know, it is the same sort of symptom and to point our fingers at each other and like we're in a circle jerk and all we're doing is pointing our fingers at each other. You know, that doesn't actually get us anywhere. And I don't think that this film or that episode or that scene really sparked any sort of dynamic conversation. It was offensive. It was disrespectful. And I'm just surprised that Spike Lee would allow disrespect to his own, considering your latest work was Black Klansman and we kind of have a white savior, a, symp a sympathetic movie to the police in the time of Black Lives Matter, but then you're so willing to castrate and be offensive to your own current peers. It's so offensive and so lazy and served no purpose. And then the cantor himself, that he was even turned on by that. He wearing kente and he'd talk about a ha ha ha. Like what? No, not good, no bueno, da 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 womp womp. So overall, so overall just to wrap it up because that's really, that was all my notes and I literally watched all the episodes and I don't, I was just like womp womp, womp womp. Nola's immature and a child, self-serving still. It wasn't enough storyline for me to really grasp onto. I just really, mm. It's not a bad watch. I mean, put it on the TV and play it on mute because it's pretty. This season of She's Gotta Have It makes a really good screensaver in motion. Just mute it because I was not a fan. But if you liked it, I would love to hear what you actually liked about it, what you enjoy. And if you agree or disagree, respectfully, you know what I mean? I'm not mad at if you don't agree with my review at all, but I would love to hear your thoughts because maybe there's something I could learn from you. I hope you did. Absolutely comment down below. And if you're new here, be sure to subscribe because we are hitting this week of late reviews all week long and there will be more critical dialogues to be had right over here. So join the party, hit that bell for notifications and thumbs up the video. Did I hit everything? I'm such a bad YouTuber. Deuces.